musician assistants will have some help and for the energy sector they have target among 314 million ton of co2 equivalent from the BAU and 446 million tons of CO equivalent with international assistance, including the emission of GHG for power generation. And on top of it, you have fulfilled the mandate from the Paris Agreement in delivering the long-term document for low carbon and for resilient with the ambition to reduce GHG in 2030 in the support of international sector and also to achieve net zero emission in 2060 or sooner than that. Based on article 52 government regulation number 56 of 2017 regarding environmental economy, the emission reduction can be done within seven years when they have stipulated the law, November 10, 2024. And we have conduct some trial for electricity, specifically for co-generated power plant. And this is aligned with the presidential regulation number 98 of 2021 on the carbon economy in achieving the contribution target that apply internationally for GHG in the national development. So the carbon is now a policy instrument. Ladies and gentlemen, in collaboration with CEFIM and OECD and also EIA, we would like to develop an ETS scheme. And this will explore many important aspects in developing relevant context for Indonesian context. So now this will be applied in November 2021 and we will talk about the progress and so implementation of ETS that has uh, discuss about the international experiences in designing and implementing the ETS scheme for electricity. So they will talk about the challenge and the design phase and talk about the potential of the expansion of ETS in the industry. And they will talk about the design and also the experience to ensure that this will fulfill the Indonesian context. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, because this is mandatory, we realize that we require further information to continue the ETS scheme. But we want to develop ETS for the future and we hope that the FGD participant can actively participating so that we can achieve the, the objective. And thank you for the OECD EIA for the support and very good collaboration in conducting the second FGD. We hope that this effort in the theme of implementation and the scheme can run properly. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We'd like to say thank you very much. Peace be upon us all. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Pak Bayu atas Oke, okay, thank you uh, Pak Bayu. Untuk menyingkat waktu speech. Bapak Ibu karena kami tadi uh, terlambat memulai, kita langsung saja uh, masuk kepada uh, sesi diskusi pertama. Sesi diskusi ini akan uh, dimoderatori oleh rekan kami dari IEA, uh, Sarah Muarif. Uh, diskusi ini akan mengambil tema uh, From Technical Design to Monitoring. Sarah, over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pak Bati. So, okay. a good afternoon, everybody, and uh, good morning to those of you in Europe. My name is Sarah Marif. I had the Environment and Climate Change Unit at the IEA with the team who've been, who've been collaborating with the OECD SEFM program on setting up these FGDs. And so very, very happy to have you all here. Uh, we have a very interesting session today where we're really going to be looking at experience from um, international emissions trading systems and um, for different decision points from setting up the system to looking at revenue which has been an important part of a lot of other systems 
Um, and also looking at a, a practical e example, uh, looking in the EU ETS. And so um, we only have about uh, 35 minutes for presentations and we'd like to leave some room for some questions and discussion. Please do put your questions in the chat box um, as they come in and we will be able to discuss them at the end of the session. So um, I'll just briefly uh, introduce the, the three speakers. So if we'll first hear from Karen McNamara, who's a senior analyst at the International Aid Energy Agency. We'll give a bit of an overview on ETS implementation um, and design decisions related to that, especially about price, um, uh, cap and scope. And then we're very pleased to have Stefano De Clara, who's the head of the International Carbon Action Partnership Secretariat, an organization that's been working with a lot of uh, partners on uh, emissions trading, who will speak specifically about revenue generation and use, and um, how this can also foster other policy objectives. And then we're very, very pleased to have Mr. Peter Viss, a senior research associate from the European University Institute. We'll be speaking about very much the, e, um, the role of the ETS within the EU's um, target climate objectives and sort of decisions and plans for changes to how the ETS uh, operates within the uh, European Union and how it links to other policy objectives as well. So I think a very interesting session. So without further ado, I'll first pass the, um, the virtual microphone to Kieran McNamara. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for the introductions. As Sarah said, I'm going to talk a little bit. Last time I met you all, I spoke about approaches, international approaches to ETS design in the power sector. This time I'm going to speak a little broader, as Sarah said, in terms of the scope of the ETS, determining the cap allocation mechanisms, as well as the more complex, or an introduction to some of the more complex elements of price setting. Next slide, please. Firstly, in general terms, what do we mean by the scope of the ETS? And I think what we're talking about here is the geographic area it applies to, the sectors it applies to, the emission sources and the greenhouse gases for which emissions will have to be surrendered, as well as the entities that will have to surrender them. And a number of factors have to be taken into account when establishing or determining the scope or coverage of an ETS. Firstly, the scope, if you like, defines the boundaries of the policy, and this has implications for the number of regulated entities, the share of emissions facing a carbon price, and the effort sharing between those sectors that are covered and those sectors that are uncovered in efforts to meet economy-wide emissions target. Secondly, in determining the scope of the ETS, it's important to highlight differences across sectors and emission sources. So key considerations include the jurisdiction's emissions profile, but not only its present profile, but its expected evolution, but what this implies for the potential for emissions reductions. You also have to take into account the ability and costs of monitoring and regulating across emissions sources, sources and at different points in the supply chain. This is also important and will be influenced in part by existing regulatory structures and policies. Finally, thoughts need to be given to the potential for non-price barriers to limit the carbon price paths pass through, the exposure to international markets, and the potential for co-benefits across other sectors, which we touched on a small bit in the previous session. Next slide, please. And so how will the ETS cap function in a general way? So this uh, picture just shows the emissions of an economy and the absence of an ETS cap on emissions in place. And if you just click once more, you'll see the difference once an ETS is working and applied. Now, as you know, the ETS tends to work on the overall principle of cap and trade. The ETS sets a limit on the total amount of emissions that can be produced by the regulated entities over a time period, and this is reflected in the number of allowances that are then issued to the market. The cap on emissions is determined in advance. It can decline over time, as you see for the green line. It provides certainty on the quantity of emissions reductions, but not on the carbon price. It's a way of imposing a cap or a limit while allowing the market the flexibility to meet the requirements through trading. And this is one of the reasons why general industry is generally very supportive of cap and trade versus some of the alternative policy options. While the ETS itself provides a long-term signal on the 
uh, price of carbon and a trajectory for investments. For some jurisdictions, the real aim is just to create a cap and implement a system then that allows the market to meet the cap as flexibly as, policy, as possible. And in an effective ETS, a facility stay, wanting to stay within the cap will also be, feel the need to implement internal mitigation actions to reduce its emissions and not rely solely on the market to provide the necessary emissions allowances. Next slide, please. And the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about how the cap works itself. Policymakers can determine the cap in a number of different ways. And this choice then determines the predictability of emissions reductions. One way is to determine an absolute emissions target or what's sometimes called a mass-based target. And this cap fixes a maximum amount of emissions in an ETS expressed in an absolute form. So for example, in tons of CO2 equivalent with only one variable, in other words, the quantity of emissions is concerned. This provides certainty on the performance of the ETS and is applied in the majority of existing systems, for example, in Canada, in the European Union, in Korea, in the Northeastern US states, in the RGGI and in Tokyo. But an alternative approach, and it's the preferred choice in Indonesia during the pilot period, is to set an intensity capped cap or a relative emissions reduction target. This means that the target is expressed in emissions reductions per unit of output. In other words, tons of CO2 per megawatt hour, for example. So in this case, it's a little bit more complex, two or more variables involved, and the target is the level of emissions intensity that a given installation must remain below. With the intensity based target, however, actual emissions or absolute emissions may arise. And China, for example, has also adopted emissions intensity based cap with changes according to actual production and output levels. The thing about intensity based targets is they tend to be selected where there's greater uncertainty about future levels of output and demand growth, which is sometimes the case in emerging market and developing economies. The choice of cap you make, be it the intensity based or the absolute mass based cap, depends on the intended role of the ETS and the relative importance that the policymakers are likely to assign to predictable emissions reductions. The key to AQA is that absolute mass-based caps offer certainty on the emissions reductions performance in the system, while an intensity-based cap offers flexibility in the face of uncertain economic output, but less predictable in terms of emissions reductions. The next question you're going to ask yourself is how ambitious the, ambitious the cap should be. Usually an ETS in any economy is just one of several instruments that might be used in reaching the overall or overarching economic, subnational and sectoral emissions targets. The ambition of the cap therefore should align with the overall strategy and policies of the government. The decision on how, <clears throat> how much mitigation responsibility to assign to sectors under the cap should be based on the capacity of the regulated and uncovered sectors to reduce their emissions. To maintain and to hold political acceptance, the level of the cap needs to perceive, be perceived by stakeholders as fair and environmentally credible. And given the central role in the cap in determining the ambition and the level of the price, prior engagement with stakeholders is vital to the cap setting process. And I think that's really helpful that we're having this conversation with so many of you stakeholders here today. In all cases, cap setting, irrespective of the approach that's adopted, requires a robust data foundation regarding historical emissions, estimates of future emissions, and estimates of technical and economic reductions potential. Next slide, please. The allowance allocation mechanism adopted affects the efficiency of system by influencing the abatement incentives. And there are a number of approaches to allowance allocation. The two principal headings we'll talk about are the auction and the free allocation. And there are a number of options for free allocation, such as grandparenting, benchmarking, and output-based uh, allocation. A hybrid approach may also be adopted where some, but not all entities in some, but not all sectors may receive some free, free allowances. Click again, please. Um, and again, 
allowance allocation is a very, very important um, determinant of the distributional impact of the ETS. Because large amounts of resources are at stake, allocation decisions can be highly contentious and they tend to be a key focus of the stakeholder attention and political discussion we talked about earlier. In terms of free allocation, if companies compete in markets outside of the ETS, there is a very strong risk that production and investment could shift to areas with laxer um, climate regulations, so-called carbon leakage, which would harm the local economy, the implementing economy, without actually reducing worldwide or global um, emissions. And free allocation of uh, permits can compensate these vulnerable sectors for their carbon costs, allowing them to continue to be competitive in the market. And in Quebec, for example, in Canada, emissions intents of trade-based sectors receive free allowances because they're considered um, vulnerable to carbon leakage. And it's the same in most ETS schemes at the outset of the design. Many developing countries tend to avoid auctioning at the initial stages of ETS design. And generally, if it's introduced at all in any scheme, it's introduced on a limited scale initially with the intention to let it gradually replace free allocation. In general, and as we spoke about the last day, the power sector is a typical candidate for auctioning because it's less prone to carbon leakage than the other ETS sectors, while manufacturing sectors that have typically received some form of reallocation generally do so in the initial years. And the strategic use of the revenues obtained from an auction are also a very, very powerful selling point for selling the ETS to stakeholders. Next slide, please. So I'll just talk for a few minutes about the various mechanisms for allocation um, uh, permits freely. The first option is uh, grandparenting. This is a word you'll hear a lot we're talking about ETS. And this is simply that companies receive free allowances based on historical emissions from a specified period. It's relatively simple, moderate data requirements. However, it has the disadvantage that it reduces the need to trade in early years and it can also penalize companies that invest in emissions reductions early in the process. In terms of benchmarking, companies receive free allowances de determined by a set of performance standards based on the emissions intensity of a product or across an entire sector. It has positives and negatives. For example, it addresses some of the fairness concerns we talked about in terms of grant parenting and rewards early actions. On the other hand, it requires a lot of high quality data and a very deep understanding of what could be sometimes very, very complex industrial processes. Another way of benchmarking is to establish fixed performance standards for certain products or sectors. And these benchmarks can be fixed at an average performance level or at best practice levels or at some sort of value determined in between. In China, for example, benchmarking is used as the main allocation method with perhaps four distinct benchmarks, one for conventional coal-fired plants below 300 megawatts, one for plants above that threshold, one for unconventional coal, and one for natural gas. Another useful example is in Kazakhstan, where in the third stage of their ECS, in contrast, operators could choose an allocation method between grandparenting and product-based benchmarking. Next slide, please. Another method of benchmarking is to update allocation according to the actual output of a company or installation, sometimes called the outpost-based allocation mechanism. And this method addresses the least risk of leakage for vulnerable companies, but on the other hand, then it, it can dampen the carbon price incentive for them. And in general, the allocation method adopted by a market varies across jurisdictions and sectors. The key point is tapered and adjusted for the individual circumstances of each of the countries. And there in the bottom of the slides, you'll see it just a matrix of approaches adopted over the past 15 years in various markets. Next slide, please. So what can we expect from an auction? Well, auctions are quite simply the allocation of the allowances by means of a market mechanism. And what this does, it ensures the efficient function of the trading market, and it gives strong or incentives for carbon abatements. But the other key point is that it creates a source of public revenue that can then be distributed amongst a wide range of potential beneficiaries. Now, generally, existing ETS schemes vary substantially in the extent to which they use option. At one end of the spectrum, for example, our GGI in Northwest United States, Northeastern United States, started with very high levels of auctioning. And within the scheme, each participating state 
was allowed to choose how to spend their revenue. And this in turn is primarily invested in consumer revenue programs, such as energy efficiency, renewables, assistance for bills, and other greenhouse gas reduction programs elsewhere. Uh, for example, in California, it was sold as a revenue raising instrument from the very beginning, with about 35% of the revenues raised going towards support for disadvantaged and low income families and communities. Elsewhere, the, for example, in the EU ETS, the use of auctioning has expanded over time, primarily from the power sector. Auctioning was the default method of allocating allowances in the third phase of the EU ETS. And I think the EU estimates that about almost 60% of general allowances were auctioned in phase three. In the coming phase, phase four, the share of allowances auctioned will remain roughly the same. In contrast, in other jurisdictions, and for example, China, which we heard about in the first session, allowances are not allocated via auctioning, although this is likely to change at some point in the future. Next slide, please. Just a few words on industry. We touched upon carbon leakage and the risks presented to an economy earlier in the presentation, just to highlight a few points. The treatment of industry in an ETS is something that's very sensitive. It requires careful thought and it can create competitive and carbon leakage concerns. To date, almost all existing ETS attempt to prevent the carbon price from lowering the competitiveness of industry or an entire sector of the economy by including features aimed at reducing the costs that the ETS can bring for some sensitive trade exposed industries. Most ETS we talked about earlier tend to reduce the direct cost of these industries by providing free allowances to those. It has also proved to be more politically and economically feasible than other alternatives such as financial compensation, cash transfers, exemptions from the ETS or carbon border adjustments. But it's very, very important to highlight that there is a need to phase down the allocation as a transitional assistance over time in favor of auctioning. Something to think about in the long to medium term. Next slide. Finally, a word on pricing. Generally, um, this is one of the most complex and political sensitive elements of designing an ETS. And in theory, that the demand and supply of the market for allowances should determine the price. So when an economy is growing, emissions tend to rise and the level of abatement necessary to meet the cap should rise with it also. Conversely, when an economy is slowing or in recession, prices should fall. Expectations about the allowance market also drive price formation, as do shocks, market shocks, external shocks, regulatory uncertainty, and market imperfections. Uh, regulated entities emitting plants can manage fertility in various ways, and many ETS designs take into this account. Mechanisms that promote flexibility and certainty of carbon price are fundamental to ensure that trading systems can respond to unexpected and unintended impacts. For example, to the economic crisis in 2008, 2009, which had a big impact on the European ETS, or even the COVID pandemic today, or the impact of high uh, natural gas prices that we're seeing in the EU at the moment. The purpose of the ETS, or at least one of the key purposes of the ETS, should be to support a predictable climate for investment. And if the objective of the economy is to achieve long time decarbonization at least cost and drive structural transformation, price variability can lead to suboptimal investments. This means that companies sit back and take a wait and see approach to the market and delay their investments that they would have otherwise made. And what this does is introduce the rationale, say, for example, for a regulator to introduce a mechanism such as a price floor, which they did in the UK in 2013, and you might hear a little bit about that later on. RGGI also introduced a price floor, a price, price floor early in the process, recognising that it was needed. There's a lot of ways to tackle low prices. The three, auction, the three options most regularly used are... Um, setting a reserve price at an auction, in other words, the minimum price at which uh, regulated entities can pay for permits, the market committing to purchase a limited number of permits to support prices are imposing a surrender charge in limited companies. Prices that are too high can also undermine the viability of the ETS, providing a rationale um, 
So this provides the rationale for market intervention. In the EU UETS at the moment, prices have hit $80 per tonne of CO2, and that's leading a lot of call for market intervention. Uh, thanks very much for listening to the presentation. I hope it wasn't too long, and we're happy to discuss everything in there later in the presentation. Thank you very much, Kieran. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was an excellent overview of a lot of the key issues, which I think really also sets up our uh, next speakers who will be looking at some of these issues in a bit more detail. So I think that's really, really perfect. Thank you for that. Um, and so Stefano, if you are ready to discuss the revenue issue um, that Kieran touched upon in a bit more detail, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you very yeah. much. Sure, and thanks again for the, for the invite to, to be here. And I'm really grateful uh, to, um, for, for uh, the, um, the scene setting presentation that uh, Kieran uh, just uh, shared that will make my job a lot uh, easier. So yeah, I'll be digging a bit deeper into, the, uh, into some aspects related to the, uh, to the auctioning and use of uh, revenues uh, side of, uh, of things. Just, like, as, just as a quick note of uh, context, in, in case you're not familiar with the uh, ICAP, the International Carbon Action Partnership, we are uh, a partnership of uh, 39 different uh, national and subnational governments that uh, are either implementing or planning to, to implement uh, an emission trading systems and get together under the, the auspices of uh, ICAP to share best practices and to um, to work together on, on advancing the implementation of, uh, of emission trading systems. Uh, so building on what uh, Karen just uh, presented really, um, ETS uh, and uh, the, the allowance creation process uh, does uh, create value. And uh, theoretically speaking, you have uh, different uh, processes or, or different approaches to allocation that, that, that determine who, um, gets a, uh, a climate rent out of that uh, value. So it can be a public rent in, uh, in case of auctioning or uh, a private rent in case of, uh, of grandfathering. And uh, determining the allocation method obviously comes with uh, policy objectives and policy relevant uh, considerations as with the, uh, with the design of uh, all the other uh, design options for, for emission trading systems. So some uh, considerations that play a role are uh, how you want to manage the, the transition to an ETS. And in this case, uh, typically some permits are freely allocated as a, um, as a way to compensate or to allow uh, covered entities to, um, to learn by uh, doing, so to speak. Uh, allocation can also be used uh, to, uh, to mitigate uh, carbon leakage uh, concerns. It is not the, uh, the only method to, uh, to mitigate uh, carbon leakage concerns, but it is uh, possibly the, uh, the most uh, widely uh, used one. Um, a policy objective could, uh, could obviously be to, to raise uh, revenues, and this is what I will uh, dig uh, into in this presentation. Um, or, as Karen also just said, um, allocation, an allocation method can be uh, ch uh, chosen to, to make sure that uh, abatement incentives are uh, preserved. Um, and auctioning uh, really speaks to, to these last two, two points. So uh, Karen also covered this, so we'll not go uh, really in detail into this slide, but there are advantages and disadvantages to, um, to auctioning. And similarly, there are um, advantages and disadvantages to, to free allocation, which is the main uh, alternative. Um, and on the advantages side, uh, raising revenues, um, being uh, a simple and fair system, uh, and um, preserving the, the abatement incentives are the, the major uh, upsides of, uh, of auctioning as, a, um, as an allocation method. Um, it's worth looking at uh, what different systems uh, are uh, using an, as an allocation method. And also it's worth looking at uh, how different systems are uh, making use of the, of the revenues they generate uh, through uh, auctioning. And uh, as you might know, uh, there are a lot of uh, systems in, in operation uh, worldwide already. So there's also a considerable amount of uh, lessons learned from, uh, from those uh, systems. Uh, as with uh, most uh, other uh, design elements to an ETS, you will find a wide range of different uh, approaches and different design options to the, to the allocation method. Uh, 
so on this slide, you can see how uh, different systems arrange um, um, for what concerns the, the auction share, um, ranging all the way from 100% in Reggie to uh, almost close to zero in, uh, in Korea, which you have on this slide, but you also have other systems that are at uh, zero uh, auctioning. Uh, and at the same time, um, the auction uh, percentage of, um, of overall allocation also tends to, to change uh, over time. As Karen also pointed out, systems uh, tend to, um, to start with, a, um, with predominantly freely allocated allowances and then auctioning is introduced uh, over time as uh, market participants get uh, compliance experience and as the, as the system uh, matures. And in this slide, you can see how most systems uh, move to, uh, to a higher level of uh, auctioning uh, over time and over sub sub subsequent uh, phases. Um, possibly the, the main uh, implication of auctioning is that uh, governments do raise uh, auctioning revenues from uh, auctioning uh, permits and uh, Revenues that are raised uh, through auctioning can be uh, quite uh, consistent. So there are, like historically, uh, over the uh, over the years, uh, more than uh, 100 billion uh, US dollars have been raised uh, through auctioning uh, worldwide. And here you can see how um, different systems uh, raised uh, different levels of uh, revenues uh, over time. The amount of uh, revenues you raise is obviously a function of uh, how big um, your uh, ETS coverage is, meaning uh, how many uh, permits you have in the system. It's also a function of uh, what is the percentage of those permits that you uh, actually um, auction, as opposed to uh, the percentage of um, permits that you uh, freely allocate. And Finally, it's also obviously a function of the uh, of the price uh, in the system. And here you can you can see, for example, how the uh, the ETS, which uh, is the, the second biggest uh, emission trading systems in the world, and that auctions roughly fifty percent of uh, its permits, and that uh, and that has uh, high prices, uh, has also raised um, a significant amount of revenues. Uh, systems that are uh, smaller in scope uh, have lower prices or uh, use uh, predominantly uh, free allocation have instead uh, raised uh, less uh, revenues. Um, and then the, the next thing that is worth uh, considering is uh, what uh, governments can do uh, with, the, with the funds that they, uh, that they raise from, uh, from auctioning. And uh, even on, uh, on this front, if you look at uh, experiences and design options from different uh, systems, you will find uh, possible different uh, ways to, uh, to use uh, auctioning uh, revenues um, and that can be broadly grouped into uh, three main ways to, uh, to spend revenues. So they can either uh, just contribute to the, to the public budget. So without being uh, ear earmarked for a specific uh, use, they just uh, go into the, the general uh, government budget and then the government decides uh, how to use them as part of the broader um, gov um, governmental uh, expenditure pro uh, program, um, or instead, uh, auction can be um, auction revenues can be earmarked for uh, specific purposes. So, for example, uh, one typical case is whereby um, auctioning revenues are used or earmarked to to fund uh, climate action. So, they are specifically set aside uh, and invested in uh, adaptation or uh, renewable deployment or any other kind of uh, low carbon um, technology implementation, for example, or for energy efficiency measure. And in a lot, in a lot of cases, um, they are also earmarked to, to provide uh, financial assistance uh, to uh, disadvantaged uh, groups. So for example, they can support low-income uh, households uh, against the, uh, the rising energy costs, for example, or to, to facilitate the transition uh, to a low-carbon uh, economy. And um, different systems have um, make different uh, uses of revenues. Uh, 
uh, and um, without uh, spending a lot of time on, on this slide, because I'm conscious that we're running out of time, I, will just, I just wanted to, to provide a couple of examples from different systems. So, for example, in the uh, EU, uh, auctioning uh, is handled by the, by the member states, and member states decide how to use their auctioning revenues. There is a requirement to use, under the, the current uh, uh, regulation, there's a requirement to use um, at least 50% of the auction revenues uh, to further uh, climate action. And on top of that, the UETS also has uh, specific uh, funds that are used uh, to, um, to fund, uh, for example, technology deployment uh, and, uh, and the modernization of uh, energy systems. And in the, in the graph on, on the right-hand side, you can see how, uh, you can see where um, auctioning revenues went to and how it was, uh, it was spent. Uh, Reggie also, as Kiran uh, already touched on, uh, puts a lot of emphasis on, on the investment uh, side of uh, things and uh, more or less 80% of uh, auctioning revenues have uh, so far uh, been invested in consumer benefit, benefit programs. Uh, they have contributed to create uh, new jobs and uh, more specifically, again, on the, uh, on the graph on, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see more specifically the, the breakdown of uh, how they were uh, used. Um, and lastly, in, uh, in California, as it was shown on the previous slide, California really makes, uh, um, has different purposes to, to its auctioning uh, revenues uh, and, um, and the ways in, in which it uh, uses that. Um, and it breaks that down into a general budget, into a support to, um, to communities, and also in uh, further advancing uh, climate action and investing in uh, clean energy and uh, energy efficiency. And even there in California, this is done uh, through different uh, funds that are used to, um, to employ um, revenues from, from the auctioning process. Uh, in general, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of lessons learned and different examples uh, about like how you can uh, spend and use the um, the auctioning revenues. And I think it's worth looking at uh, what different systems have uh, experimented with and what are the the success uh, stories out of uh, best practices that are uh, existing around the world. So I just wanted to put uh, up in the in the slide the uh, the sources um, that I used to prepare the presentation, which might also be a good food for thought uh, if you want to find out more about uh, different and possible ways to to use uh, auctioning uh, revenues. Uh, and I'll keep it to that, and I'll uh, I'll give the defer back to to Sarah. Happy to take any question you might have uh, later. Thank you so much, Stefano. Um, yeah, super interesting and uh, great to share all the, the resources. I think very interesting to see the different ways this is, this is used and, and perhaps you know, something like revenue might seem like a, a sort of far away problem given the, the shift to auctioning is, um, is not immediate sometimes in a lot of systems, but in, in some cases it can go you know, faster than planned. I mean, we, we know the China ETS obviously does, does not um, auction allowances currently, but this is something that's even now after one year of operation is now coming up and has to start being explored. So these things can move um, quite quickly. So it's good to, to have them in mind. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for that. I think we'll pass without ado to our, our third speaker, Mr. Peter Viss. I'll pass you the floor. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon in the case of those of you in Indonesia. Um, so I am a, a former civil servant of the European Union, and I worked on the development of the EU's emissions trading system, you know, over 20 years ago. So uh, it's been running 16 years now as a system, and of course, it's changed in that time. And I will be trying to explain, um, first of all, how exciting and frightening it was to develop an emissions trading system. Um, we had to work incredibly hard and I'm sure you too will have to work very hard on this, but it's, it's, it's been a great success. Um, and I would say the emphasis of my presentation is what is possible and not 
always what is theoretically optimal, you know, because policy making is often the art of the possible. So if we go on to the first slide, much of this has been already very well explained by Kieran, for example. Um, we first of all, with an emissions trading system, which in the US is called a cap and trade, you have to set a cap. And we have had caps in Europe um, and we've had a different cap per phase of the emissions trading system. We have had four phases so far. Um, the pilot phase was for three years and that was getting used to it, trying things out that we had never done before. The second phase coincided with the legal obligation the European Union had under the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the third phase was the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. And the fourth phase, which we are in now, is the phase running to 2030, which corresponds with the European Union's first NDC. And indeed, we're now, we have revised, made a second nationally determined contribution. Um, and so that is all under revision at the moment. But there have been so far four phases, each of them with a cap. Next slide, please. Now, when we were starting this, we had, to be, we had to know where to start. We had to decide where to start because we were not certain of anything. But we looked at the numbers and that ex it, it showed us that CO2 was by far the largest uh, greenhouse gas and it was the only one we thought we could accurately measure, monitor, measure uh, and report on. Um, it was also, we, we worked out that the thousand, uh, 10,000 or so largest installations, factories or power stations in the EU were responsible for approximately nearly half of the EU's CO2 emissions. So, this is according to the 80-20 principle, you know, only 10,000 sources of emissions uh, and they were large sources constituted nearly 50% of our CO2 emissions. We were only counting scope one, the direct emissions, such as is used under the Kyoto Protocol and, and the Paris Agreement. Um, and of course, as Kieran already said, the cap will, depend upon uh, the sectors that are covered, the gases are that are covered, um, and indeed the desired environmental outcome, which was in effect what Europe was committed to fulfill under the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, it would reflect geographic coverage. We've only covered sources covered by the European Union law. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So it was, I, I, we started setting a cap that was determined by every state. There are 28, there were 28 states in the EU at the beginning of this uh, system. Um, there are now 27, uh, but we also have a few extra states uh, in the European economic area. So there's about 31 uh, countries covered by the European emissions trading system. And at the very beginning, we let countries decide the amounts of allocation or the cap uh, that would be attributed to different installations. That, we quickly changed that. Um, as has been said, you know, we, we didn't start with the intention of quickly changing it, but we did quickly change it um, because there were observed to be differences in the treatment of similar installations in different states. And because European market is a single market, uh, there were competitive distortions. So very quickly, even industry wanted there to be more harmonized approaches to the, to the uh, cap setting. And so basically that's what we did in the third and the fourth phases we decided through modeling what would be an appropriate reduction to be made, a cost-efficient reduction to be made by the sectors 
covered with the covered by the emissions trading system. And of course, we had to bear in mind the targets we were assuming under the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement as well. So the next slide, please. We, in effect, were already learning by doing, um, and we went from a bottom up to a top down approach to the fixing of caps. Um, and we have basically decided in the to 2020, we wanted a 21% reduction by 2020 compared to 2005. And we've increased that level of ambition to a 43 reduction uh, to 2030, uh, again, compared to 2005. So you can see that the stringency of the different phases is increasing, as you would, I think, expect. Um, and what characterizes an emissions trading system, of course, is that the, the cap that is represented by the number of allowances issued comes down progressively and predictably over time. And that is indeed what we're doing in Europe. At the moment, we're revising that reduction of 43%. It's going to be even more ambitious for the emissions trading sector, somewhere in the region of 60, 61% by 2030, because we have made a more ambitious pledge under the Paris Agreement. Uh, the next diagram, uh, the next figure shows the progress of uh, our emission reductions. So next slide, please. Um, it, here we are. I said there were four phases so far. You can see them in different columns of color. Uh, here they're different colored. And you can see that the dotted line is actual emissions and the where there is no more dotted lines, we don't have final data for, but you can see that the trend, the cap is coming down progressively and by a predictable amount. At the moment, the law says of 2.2% per year. So everyone knows scarcity is increasing. And as ambition is increased, uh, that reduction factor of 2.2% is going to be increased, we think, to 4.2%. But companies can already know that's going to be the case and they start planning, they anticipate. And indeed the carbon price also anticipates future scarcity of these allowances. So that's how we are performing. And there is quite clearly a reduction what you can see is that in the very first phase where we weren't very sure because we didn't have good data, um, you can see that the actual emissions were above uh, the amount of allowances. Um, and that's, you know, it was just a fact of the early years that we didn't really know how stringent a cap we should uh, set, but uh, we took the precaution of having what we call a firewall, the very first period, uh, we didn't let there be any banking of allowances into the second period. So in effect, if you still had an allowance at the end of 2007, it became worthless. And, and that's, we made a new start, but that was an, in, an incredibly important phase in Europe uh, because we learned a lot during that first phase and we collected a lot of data. Let's just have a look at the lessons we learned very quickly. Um, at the very beginning, we had no data per installation. It's incredible to think of that now. Next slide, please. We were really, uh, you know, we were starting in a suboptimal way, but uh, we, we collected data and I have quoted reductions since 2005 as being the way we set the targets. The reason is, it's 2005 is we have no data before 2005. So do, you know, I would emphasize the importance of data, whatever you decide to do, you, you, you can't very well do it uh, without the data. And indeed we used modeling capacity, economic modeling and energy modeling to help us decide how much to 
allocate to the ETS and how much to leave for the other sectors of the economy. Um, as I said, there was a, it was a good decision to have a pilot phase because we were very much learning. We were the first jurisdiction to do such a system. So let's go on and look at the next slide. The allocations methods, uh, what I'm going to talk about. And as Kieran has already said, we have indeed moved from uh, different methods of allocation. We started off using historic emissions, which is often called grandfathering um, in the first two phases. And indeed the national governments in the EU were responsible for those allocations. There was too much over allocation and there was too much distortion. So very quickly, industry itself wanted harmonized methodologies. So we introduced free allocation according to benchmarks. And the benchmarks were set. Actually, they weren't set by bureaucrats in the commission where the civil service I worked for. Um, sorry, I can't get rid of that. Um, meeting request that's come up on the screen. Someone else can perhaps uh, remove it. But the 10, what we said was the 10% best performing in any economic sector would set the benchmark. So they were actual installations and they were the 10 best installation, 10% best. And the next slide shows a, an illustration of how these benchmarks were determined. It, this is, takes the concrete or cement sector uh, in which we have about 250 installations across the European Union. And you see that the benchmark is the black line. We acquired a production data and emissions data for each of those installations. Indeed, the reason we could get that production data was that if the entities didn't give us the data, they didn't get free allocation. So there was an incentive to give the data we needed to set to set the benchmark. Um, and indeed we asked it for, to be verified data by an independent verifier. So, you know, we knew it was reliable data. And you can see that the, to the left of that graph, the very best performing 10%, uh, that's the benchmark is set at the average of those. So approximately 5% of them get more allocation than they need and everybody else gets less than they strictly need. Um, and that means at the very end, at the right side of the graph, the laggards are getting significantly net less than they agree. So they have to go to the market and buy extra allowances. So to some extent, although they receive free allocation, they don't receive enough free allocation. So there is an incentive for them to invest and become one of the best performing in their sector. So let's move to the next slide. I'm sorry to rush, but this is how it is. Uh, we don't have much time. The electricity and heat generation sector, we, I call them the power sector. We have been auctioning to them. We've been making them buy their allowances from governments since 2013. And that continues. And as has been said, um, they produce significant amounts of money. I'll mention at the very end, as indeed Stefano has already said. Um, the auctions are actually open to everyone with an registry account. So all other companies, the industry sectors as well, um, but equally you could be an NGO and have a an registry account and choose to buy if you wanted. Um, and there are a few exceptions for the less wealthy member states because fairness is a very big issue in the European Union. We are 27 member states today, but their relative wealth varies very significantly. And in the case of the 10 less wealthy member states, they are allowed to allocate for free to their power sector on condition that the revenues they have foregone as a government those amounts of money still have to be invested in modernizing the energy system. And so in practice, um, many of those countries choose to auction as well, even though they don't have to, um, because it, they would have to in any case, 
invest money in modernizing their energy systems. So we have seen a certain evolution of allocation methods over time, um, but it's been a case of learning by doing. And indeed, as has been said, the importance of revenue generation was increasingly seen as significant. So the next slide gives a very quick overview of the state of play in the current phase where we auction uh, about, you know, something like 56% uh, through auctioning one way or another. Um, and much of it is free. The main point is that most of the allocation is by auctioning, but free allocation to industry still exists. And we have a number of funds that we basically, uh, we sell those allowances by auctioning and we use the money for innovation or for modernizing energy systems. And that's the way of using revenue. Um, and there's also, of course, this, what we're about, we've recently proposed a social climate fund to uh, finance the, the renovation of housing. So, you know, this is indeed throwing up a lot of revenues. The next slide, I just wanted to say something that I think is important. A lot of people say, but who trades? Is it the government? Is it the commission? Where do people go to trade? Well, the first thing is in Europe, the governments don't trade. They only allocate allowances against payment in auctions. Um, it's businesses who trade on a secondary market that might be business to business, or it might be business to financial institution to business or through exchanges where they don't necessarily know who it is who's buying. And those things have developed spontaneously. I would say that they are regulated by the financial regulations. So financial law applies, no insider trading and things like that. That is illegal. Uh, no market manipulation, that is illegal. But we rely on financial market regulations to police this market as well. But it isn't governments who get involved in trading. It's businesses, and they only trade if they want to. If you don't want to, you just have to make sure that your emissions match the number of allowances you can surrender in a given period. So it's sometimes uh, people ask, who, who, who is it who organizes the trade? The trade organizes itself, in fact. Um, okay, and then the next slide, please. I'm getting very near the end. The, You've seen there's a lot of learning by doing. Data has improved and we started with none. So we've come a long way since then. There has been the tendency in the European Union to have a greater harmonization over time, but this has not been for reasons of the environmental protection. It's because of competition concerns. And there has also been, uh, well, it's well understood if you like, that allocation is distributional, even if you give it for free, the environmental objective of an emissions trading system is determined by the total number of allowances that are issued. So in that respect, whether you give them for free or against payment, it's the same environmental outcome. But of course, the big difference is, if you move to the next slide, if you do them for payment, if you have auctions for payment, you, you will then have what we call sometimes a double dividend for the policymakers. You reduce emissions by there being a price on pollution. And with the revenues which belong to government, you can do good things for climate change, such as fund innovation or fund fairness and a just transition which we find increasingly important to keep public support for the emissions trading system. And my last slide is of the carbon price, about which you probably expect to see something. You can see that very significant uh, price variations have happened over time. I think for most of the 16 years we've had emissions trading in Europe, the price has been too low. And right now, 
it's possibly a bit too high. It's around 70 euros at the moment. Um, and even 80, I mean, it's, it's gone up as far as 95. Uh, now, this is a world where industry is having a considerable cost of polluting. So it's looking for ways to minimize its cost. And governments are generating significant revenues that they can use to invest in innovation. And the combination of those two things, I think, is potentially very powerful and which will enable the EU to be very ambitious uh, using this instrument that has become such a key to our uh, climate policy in general. So thank you for the time. Um, that's my last slide. I've got a, a thank you slide coming, but that's it. Um, I'm happy to stay for questions if there's time. Thank you, Sarah. Super, thank you so much. That was really uh, perfect. I think it's, uh, it's excellent to, to, to be able to benefit from, you know, one of having you be able to speak to these issues, having been there from the beginning, understanding how these were set up and, um, and uh, I think very inspiring um, and sort of reassuring sort of lesson that, you know, you start where you start and you, you, you figure things out as you go along, new problems arise and things can adapt. Uh, and so it's, I think it's very nice to hear that. Um, I do believe that we will take um, 15 minutes potentially now for our Q&A session and just um, shift the next session a little bit later, if I understand correctly. So I think we will uh, leave the floor open for questions. I may um, pass on to Kieran McNamara, who will be uh, moderating the next session a bit so sooner, uh, as um, we did start the session a bit late, and I, I um, will not be able to, to stay very long. But uh, if there are questions in the chat, or if people want to raise their hands, um, again, you can ask your question in, in Bahasa as well. Please um, feel free. I see Hani has a hand Hi. raised. Microphone off. Hani, yes. please, yes. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. So uh, I'm Hani Bergman, so I'm sorry, I need to put on my video. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, permission. So my name is Hani Bergman from USAID Sinar Project. So we already work for uh, uh, DGK on the power sector to do benchmarking analysis in the past. So uh, my question to our speakers, uh, I agree that caps for greenhouse gas emissions should be based on accurate data and accurate benchmarking analysis result, not based on the prediction without basis. So, so this is very clear. Caps on greenhouse cap, cap emission uh, uh, should be based on clear benchmarking methodology implementation, for example, for power sector. So from our understanding, because we have done this together with uh, DGK uh, last time on the ICE2 project, which is actually a uh, USAID project, there are many parameters that affect the greenhouse gas emissions, such as technology, capacity factor, load factor, fuel availability, and so on. From your experience, this is I like to get insight actually from the speaker here. Is there available documentation, research, or methodology that can be used as reference for us to do benchmarking so that we can learn and replicate more? So that is my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that would be a question for Peter, uh, probably, and then Stefano. I don't know if you have something you'd like yeah. to um, well, Hani, first I would say you're absolutely right that any attempt to predict the future will be wrong. So, you know, we wouldn't, uh, from our experience, recommend trying to predict. Indeed, we've often been surprised. You know, we started our emissions trading in about 2005. 
Um, and then in 2008, nine, we had a terrible financial crisis, which we hadn't foreseen. Um, we were assuming economic growth and in fact, the economy crashed. <laughs> So we were wrong uh, from the start, and I wouldn't recommend prediction. You do need data, um, but any free allocation to some extent will be either unfair or complicated, which is, if you like, a strong case for using auctioning because there is no administrative process beyond the conducting of auctions in a fair and transparent way. And that is something that's very achievable. Um, there is literature on benchmarking, but it, it's not very detailed. I've written some of it myself. I will try and put a, a, a reference in the chat to two books uh, that I've edited uh, that talk about the emissions trading and its evolution over time. But essentially, you you need to decide on a method and we decided on that 10 percent of the samples you know the 10 percent best performing in a sample of a sector so you've got to delimit the sector and there are about 54 different sectors which have specific benchmarks and then there's two more general sectors for the rest of the economy so it depends if you fit in one of the 54 categories of benchmark, you become part of the sample size, you submit your production data and your emissions data, and then they can work out who performs most efficiently. And it's the 10% best. So it's a method which has a certain, uh, it's, it's, if you like, created by the sector itself, or at least the establishment of the 10% is, is depending on each sector and the sorts of actors they have in it. I like that as an approach, but it is still complicated. And in Europe, we have some people saying, yes, we're part of this sector, but in fact, we're different from the others. We need our own benchmark. And, and you know, there's, we have to sort of make choices as to how many sectors there will be. But the data is something that companies will provide if you say that their free allocation is conditioned on that provision of data. So the incentive is for them to give you it. So collecting the data hasn't proven to be a problem for us, um, even for very difficult sectors, because everyone wants free allocation if they can get it. Um, and then, of course, you have to check on the reliability. So it has to be audited by an independent third party. So with these safeguards, data collection is possible. And as I say, the benchmarking we've used is really established by the sector itself and not by administrators. <laughs> so that's our approach. And I'll give you the references to the books uh, that I've edited, but there's lots of literature out there. I think Stefano gave some excellent literature re references as well. Thank you, Peter. I'm stepping in for Sarah at this point. She's diverted to another meeting. Uh, Stefano, would you like to add anything to that? Because it sounds to me as if uh, data gathering, benchmarking, et cetera, something that's worth investing a lot of time in and something that's try to get as, as accurate as possible from the outset if this is going to work. And as Peter says, if you're going to get the utilities and companies to invest in this scheme. I'll pass yeah, to you, no. Stefano, because I see from your publications, you may have some context for this also. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And um, I think Peter did a great uh, job already, obviously. So I'll just add a couple of uh, considerations. I mean, it is true that uh, benchmarking is a, um, is a crucial component of your ETS design. So it is something that uh, it's important to get uh, right. And, um, you know, as Peter also pointed out, there are a lot of uh, experiences on uh, how benchmarks were designed and uh, implemented in, in practice in different uh, systems. So from that point of view, I think it could be worth looking at, uh, you know, what approaches different uh, emission trading systems are using to, um, to implement benchmarking. But at the same time, um, and as Peter also pointed out, it's important to, um, to then, you know, reflect on, on, on the approaches available understand which one works better for the domestic uh, circumstances 
And also at the same time, it's important to, to base that approach on, uh, on, on the domestic uh, data and uh, data availability is something that uh, comes along with um, ETS implementation, um, as Peter pointed out. Um, and it's also worth reflecting on, um, you know, what uh, different uh, potential benchmarking design options, for example, uh, mean for the uh, for the sectors uh, covered. For example, I mean, talking a bit more specifically about the um, the, the power sector that you mentioned, there uh, there are implications. For example, if uh, you decide to to implement uh, just one benchmark for for the whole sector or if you start uh, implementing uh, you know specific benchmarks for uh, specific uh, ways of uh, producing uh, power and um, that will have an implication for again the incentives that you create uh, for uh, for example the ability of, of DTS to to drive uh, fuel switching and uh, and also for how then the um, the price signal is reflected and in, uh, in, um, in the sector. Um, but yeah, again, interesting to, to look at uh, experiences that are made with, uh, with available systems. I would encourage you to have a look at uh, um, a few of, uh, of the ICAP publications. And there also, there's also an, an ICAP paper on, on benchmarking that will be released in, uh, in early 2022. So keep an eye out, keep an eye out for, for that one as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stefana. Thank you, Peter. I think we have five minutes left, so we have time for at least another question. I have two, one from Marcus Traslika and the second from Hardy Sichirian. So, uh, Marcus, I think you were first, if you want to go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Just a short one. So, um, I'm colleague of Hani actually work in in the SINA program, USAID SINA program in, in Indonesia. Um, so here we're facing a very particular scenario where we actually don't have a don't have an energy market to start with. So everything is uh, government driven. The whole power system operates on subsidy. And uh, so I, my, I posted this question already in the chat is uh, there is a potential that there is a temptation. There's a potential for a temptation that uh, this uh, allocation mechanism of free credits, free carbon credits, it's going to be used by the governments who actually, by the government who actually owns this incredibly carbon intensive power generation fleet, which powers 80% of the country. Um, to actually utilize that as a backdoor uh, subsidy for the power generation sector. Because at this point in time, uh, they would have little credits actually to sell outside to obtain financing. So they would have to start with a deficitary market. We would have, they would have to start buying CO2 credits outside to offset the internal generation. So how can we prevent, or is there a way in the mechanism to prevent that from becoming a vicious cycle where every year you reassign new credits uh, to this uh, coal intensive processes and then those keep, keep being bought back by the government and being allowed those companies to keep doing business as usual. And in fact, not pushing the market and the sector towards what is intended with an ETS market. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. That's a very, very interesting question. And Stefano, given ICAP experience worldwide, particularly in regulated markets and where there's a lot of state-owned enterprises active in the sector, would you be in a position to give any guidance on this point? Yeah, I'm sure. Happy to, uh, to try to, uh, to address that uh, question. And, uh, you know, it's a really valid one. And um, as Peter also pointed out, the, uh, the power sector is uh, typically the, uh, um, the first and, uh, and best candidate to, to move towards uh, auctioning. Uh, and uh, again, just as a note of context, uh, most uh, systems tend to, to start with uh, 
free allocations and uh, and uh, and start with the uh, grandfathering to uh, have a um, a soft uh, start, uh, start so to speak and also because um, as Peter also um, outlined in a lot of different uh, cases you just don't have the data to to implement uh, you know benchmarking for example from the uh, from the outset uh, but at the same time as the as the system is um, established and as uh, as uh, things get uh, underway then the, the power sector is the um, the best candidate to to move towards uh, auctioning because it is a sector where typically you don't have a um, severe, for example, um, carbon leakage and comp competitiveness uh, concerns, and uh, and that uh, is you know that that can play a big factor in uh, easing the the transition towards uh, auctioning, and um, that is a um, that is also a quite an important uh, aspect be be because there is a lot of uh, evidence out there on uh, you know the role that uh, emission trading systems and the, the carbon price they, uh, they generate can uh, really play a role in uh, in decarbonizing the, the power sector and in how they can actually drive uh, the, uh, the reduction of uh, coal or carbon intensive sources and how they can uh, incentivize the uh, the fuel switching to uh, to lower carbon uh, fuels, uh, but in order to do that, you do need a um, you do need to to make sure that the uh, the carbon price signal is well reflected in the um, in the sector, and that has to do with uh, you know making sure that uh, auctioning auctioning is in place, but also. That has to do with making sure that the uh, the power market structure and the power market regulation allows for uh, the power cost to be uh, fully reflected in the um, in the power price, and that is a um, that, that that's a crucial aspect to uh, that needs to be looked at in um, in a lot of uh, countries that, for example, don't have a, uh, a fully liberalized. Um, Power market, or that have a lot of uh, state-owned uh, companies, and there, I mean, there are potential remedies to to fix that. But yeah, it's um, it, it's worth a reflection on uh, on how that uh, that can be done. Thank you, Stefano. Peter, do you want to add anything there, based on your experience within the EU? Because there are parts of the EU where there are large state-owned enterprises own large fleets of high-emitting power. That's true. Plant. In, indeed, Kieran, there are state-owned companies in some member states, but the energy market is, is liberalised. Um, and I think in Europe more generally, we have a different problem from Indonesia in that the governments need to ensure that their companies don't emit too much. And they don't have control over the government, over those companies. Um, so... And neither do the governments make the investments in new power stations that are needed for the climate transition. So uh, Indonesia is in a different place, as many other countries are in a different place from Europe. But it seems, sounds like Indonesia's government can decide on the state, or, or on the, uh, can make the power sector make reductions. But of course, the Indonesian state probably also has to make the investments for the climate transition, which is expensive. And in Europe, uh, we, you know, with a more privatized uh, energy market, um, you know, it is private companies who make that investment. And, and I think that's, you know, we are in different places. So we have different differences in how mechanisms like this might work. But uh, I think at the same time, you know, this has proven to work um, and have, as I say, the, both the environmental added value and it gives the revenues that help governments uh, address concerns, social concerns, equity concerns, which is quite a lot of advantages for us and perhaps applicable for you too. But I'm not going to say, of course, what Indonesia should do. We're different. But we can learn from each other. I'm really sure about that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Stefano. I think we've time for one final question, and we'll take that from Pakadi, who's waiting patiently here. 
If you just turn on your microphone, please. Sorry, I didn't know. Okay, what is, uh, just a short question, what is the main consideration for utilization of cross-border transfer? Cross-border. Cross-border transfer. Ah, yeah. In the EU, although we're 27 countries, there is no border as such to cross. Um, we, we, we trade as if we were a single country, in fact. Um, what we did allow in the first two, three phases of our emissions trading system, we did allow offset credits from outside the EU, the CDM uh, that is a part of the Kyoto Protocol, we allowed CDM credits to be used. Um, but we've phased that out. So no longer any imported allowances are admissible, except with the one country the EU has got a bilateral agreement with, which happens to be Switzerland in the middle of Europe. Um, and that works very smoothly. But now Europe doesn't allow offsets from outside the European Union. Um, it may decide differently in the future, but for now, it is not the intention to do it through offsetting. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Stefano, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just uh, quickly. Um, I mean, as with uh, most uh, design choices of uh, related to emission trading systems, there are pros and cons in uh, allowing, for example, the use of international credits or in... Uh, setting up a, um, a linking agreement, which is another form of uh, cross-border transfer. And uh, really just in a nutshell, uh, in general, the, uh, the advantages are that uh, you can use those are as, a, um, as a cost mitigation um, option. So usually, you know, if you allow for the use of international credits, for example, they are cheaper than domestic allowances because so you, you can give a, uh, a cost relief to cover the entities and at the same time, it can be a way to uh, promote uh, climate action uh, beyond your uh, borders and to uh, you know, transfer kind of finance to, to developing countries. On the, um, on the, uh, on the cons uh, side, um, typically there are concerns with uh, you know, uh, losing or impacting the, uh, the environmental integrity of the system if, uh, you know, if the units you allow are of a, um, of a lower quality. Um, and at the same time, uh, both with the uh, offsets and uh, linking, you do, you do lose a, uh, to some degree, uh, your ability to, to regulate uh, your domestic system because you uh, basically, uh, you know, defer that element of a governance or that element of uh, quality checking uh, to, to other uh, entities. So you do lose to some extent the, the control you, uh, you have over your, your system. There's obviously a lot more to the picture, but that is it in a, uh, in a nutshell, I think. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for your questions. Thank you for two wonderful presentations and thanks for all the intervention from the audience. I think we're gonna wrap up this session in the next couple of minutes and you're all welcome back for the second session which is going to focus on the experience of working in ETS in two European countries with very very different circumstances and we look forward to hearing you join that session so thank you Peter thank you Stefano and thanks to everybody for joining us for this session I'll pass you back to our MC in Jakarta right now uh, Bathy thank you Bobby. Uh, thank you Kiran uh, thank you all of the panelists terima kasih uh, baik Bapak Ibu sekarang kita memasuki sesi So ladies and gentlemen we will continue to the second session the first session we were discussing about technical design to monitoring the second session we will talk about how to stimulate industry participation based on experience in other markets so the first one, we have Sarah Muarif as the moderator. The second session, we will have Kieran as the moderator. Kieran from IEA. The time is yours, Kieran. It will be better if you could manage the session in 40 minutes, Kieran. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Bathy. No problem. We'll do our best. Um, sorry, folks, I was expecting a short break there between sessions, but it's, it's, uh, let's keep this ball rolling. So in this session, as I highlighted a few moments ago, we'll focus on two countries in Europe. But there is a distinction. One of those is Poland, which is a member of the European Union, and the second is the United Kingdom, which, as some of you may know, is no longer uh, part of the European Union. Therefore, it's not part of the European ETS. So our first speaker is Ms. Marta Roslanic, who joined us from Poland. Marta is the Head of Strategy Analysis and Auction Unit at Kobice, which is Poland's National Centre for Emissions Management. And for those of you in the audience that may not be familiar with Poland, it's a very large EU member country located to the east of the Union. In Poland, like Indonesia, coal dominates the power sector. It accounts for around, I think, two thirds of 150 terawatt hours of electricity output. The mining sector is a major employer. And from, I understand this almost 90,000 men working in, or people working in the mining sector today. And we've invited Marta here today to share some insights from Poland's experience of operating within the ETS with you. Our second speaker then is Dr. Daniel Sturge from the United Kingdom. Daniel is carbon practice manager at Catacol Energy Systems, which is an independent, not profit not-for-profit center of excellence, which is working with industry, government, academia, and research to bridge the gap between where we are today and where we need to be in terms of low carbon growth. And Daniel will talk a little about the EU ETS, or sorry, the UK ETS, which replaced um, Britain's participation in the EU ETS earlier this year. This scheme was established to increase the climate ambition of UK's carbon pricing policy with the intention of protecting UK businesses following their exit from the European Union. So without any delay, I'd like to pass you over to Marta as the first speaker. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much. I hope that you hear me well. Uh, I will share my presentation. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Kieran, for letting me in. I think that uh, saying about our experience, uh, Polish experience, uh, could be very well. And we really would like to help other countries uh, with their ETS. Uh, like, uh, I think that a week ago, we already uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with Kazakhstan, because we see that other member, member states, other, other states are uh, keen on um, implementing ETS. And uh, the, the, the Poland, I think that you already mentioned, Kieran, is a uh, good example to, to others. Mm, the second thing that uh, I, I want to say, it's really privileged to be a speaker after Peter Wies, because I think that this is the, the really the one person uh, in Europe that already know a lot and plenty of things about the UETS. I already, I would, I would say that uh, ETS is quite complicated uh, and uh, and there is not many people who, who know all the aspects, but maybe Peter Wies will know all of them. Uh, just a few words about uh, where I'm located. This is Institute for Environmental Protection in Poland, and the part of the Institute is Kobize, and we are administrator of EU ETS, so we tackle uh, different issues like allocation, monitoring and verification, uh, we uh, prepare reports related to the system. We also administrate the EU registry in the Polish part and the uh, auction uh, We are also uh, very uh, involved in the EU and FCCC process. So we, maybe you, you met uh, some of us uh, uh, in, in some corridors in Glasgow or Warsaw. Uh, within COBISA, we uh, recently developed Center for Climate and Energy Analysis with the nice name CAKE. And we developed um, analytical tools, modeling tools that uh, help us, help Poland, but also help other member states, European Union, uh, to analyze the situation on the European market. And during my presentation, I would present some uh, results uh, from Polish perspective. Um, history about EU ETS was already mentioned, so I'm not going to say it once more, but there are a few points that uh, I put on my list that I would like to share with you about the history and uh, our experience. Uh, 
so the one thing is the first phase that uh, Peter Wies said uh, that it was uh, free allocation based on national plan. Um, I made the master thesis about this and I heard about many people involved in the process that it was really, really complicated. Gathering the data, uh, talking to almost 800 installations uh, about their situation. Uh, it was really a nightmare for many people and it was really, really difficult uh, process. Uh, even though uh, it was done, uh, we as a Poland um, had some kind of problems uh, with, uh, with the final allocation based on that. And we went to the court to, to make a lawsuit to, to, uh, to that issue and we won that afterwards. So, so the, the number of allocation uh, was changed because we thought that at the beginning it was not done correctly. So the, the first pro process was quite complicated. Uh, after we changed uh, the, the situation and there was a benchmarking issue, uh, the second process and the, there was also in the first part there was a question about benchmarking. Uh, I think that the good uh, publication are on uh, uh, EU website, on the GCLIMA website, there are around 10 or 12 guidelines, guidebooks, uh, about uh, different type of benchmarks. So uh, please use it or share it. And, and uh, we were also involved in developing there. And for us, the idea was that the benchmarking was uh, quite uh, difficult because we are related to coal and we were compared to other industry uh, companies that use gas. So uh, really from the beginning, we were uh, on the uh, worse uh, position. Uh, we also went to the court with that, uh, our problem, we, we, we call it fuel specific benchmark problem, uh, but this kind of lawsuit we uh, lost. Um, the third thing, and there was also a question about that in the previous session, uh, was with these uh, state-owned companies and uh, especially the energy companies, electricity companies, uh, which uh, got the allowances. And the um, idea for solving the problem was the derogation. So there was a um, free allocation for those installation in electricity sector, but uh, you could use them only when you use the same amount of money for modernization. Uh, and um, the idea was brilliant because we uh, would have like 100% uh, guarantee uh, that the modernization would be done and we will use the uh, money, exact money from the uh, European uh, ETS system. Uh, but there is always, uh, the devils in the details and the, the, the system was quite complicated um, for, for many of installations. So at the end, I think that in case of Poland, like only 60 or 70% of uh, this cap, the, the amount that we had for derogation was used properly. Marta, <laughs> sorry, could I interrupt you? Would you mind yeah. sharing your slides in full screen mode, please? Um, I've got the full script mod, so maybe I will do it once again. Mm -hmm. You can see it now, okay or not? It's still yeah. not full screen, Martha. Mm -hmm. You just the presentation button. Okay. Give me a second. Mm, I'm really sorry, but in my case, it's full screen mode. So um, 
I don't know if you want to uh, share my presentation or uh, I can leave it like that. Or what do you prefer? I can share this, the presentation in full screen mode if you prefer, Martin. Okay, it, it's okay. So I will stop sharing mine. And apologies for interrupting you, Mark. <laughs> no, no problem, of course. I can see it well now, so uh, please go to the next third slide, I suppose. Next one. Oh, this one. Um, I made a short table, but I think that in uh, previous speaker's presentation it was already mentioned, so I will also uh, say something about Polish perspective. Uh, I named uh, the table advantages uh, and challenges. You can see pluses and minuses, but sometimes those pluses are, are also challenges and those minuses that there is something that, that need to be done and are quite tough thing to do. So uh, we see the uh, ETS as a cost-effective way to reduce emission. And uh, the really uh, big advantages that was already mentioned by uh, Stefan was uh, revenues. Uh, for the state budget, but also for um, installation in the UETS. So we use the, the money to modernize electricity generation sector, but also in our case, heat sector, heating sector, because we've got like huge district heating um, grids. Uh, but also for industry, it was already mentioned that there are extra uh, allowances for those sectors that uh, currently uh, under the risk of carbon leakage. There is also uh, not direct, but support for, for renewables and energy efficiency. And something that is quite important for us because of the smog problem, especially during the winters, is the reduction of emission of other pol pollutants. Uh, we really also enjoy the, um, being a partner in the international uh, efforts to, to combat uh, climate change. And I think that uh, environment awareness of our society uh, already increased because also of EU ETS. On the other hand, we, we, we see some challenges and it was really from the beginning that I already mentioned there is a lot of work to do, uh, a lot of uh, documents or regulation that's supposed to be implemented and uh, even um, re reading those documents, this is like plenty of hours. Um, the, the system in case of Europe is uh, high complex um, and it sometimes can be um, Distortion, distortion to the to the to the competition. We we see the problem of um, ongoing EUTS revision. So even now there is a new process ongoing, and uh, the, the 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 idea or the problem is that we already start uh, the, the new phase and we will change it. Uh, you know, the, the change the game when we are playing. So for us this. Is, a uh, huge problem, not only for us, but also for our installation. Next slide, please. Um, it was already mentioned the prices, and I think that uh, on my slides, the, the, the prices are the current ones. So you can see that the, this high slope is around uh, 90, uh, 90, 90 uh, euros uh, recently. Uh, so this is like 14 times more than it was at the beginning. So it's a huge difference really now for each installation. One ton of CO2 costs all, almost 100 euros. It's like a really big problem. And even now we heard from many installations, probably the small one, that is the smallest one, that uh, they will bankrupt because the price of CO2 is, is too high to them. 
and we and other member states see the problem. Uh, we, we, we are talking about the idea of implemented, implementing some kind of new uh, or, or, or the instrument that, that they are already uh, in, the, in the system to help uh, um, predict the price or, or make it uh, make it like um, easier to, 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 to go with. Uh, on the other hand, there is a table below that uh, you can see there are revenues. Uh, the revenues from 2021 are not in the table uh, yet, but still, I, I, I must admit that this is like a huge part of Polish budget, the, the, those revenues. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, several... Uh, Table slides and numbers that could be interesting interested for your point of view. Uh, on the left hand side, uh, you see the circle with energy mix for Poland uh, in 2015. Uh, it is like 81% of coal in the mix and a little bit of wind uh, or gas and uh, hydro. Uh, in our uh, center, the, the CAKE center, uh, we made, uh, based, based on our models, we made predictions. Um, I, I suppose that their graphs look very colorful, but I will explain them uh, in a few seconds, and I hope that they will be readable for you. So uh, the, the, the graph in the middle, there is electricity mix in 2020, and uh, with, within our product predictions, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Sorry. Um, sorry for my... Um, so um, the, the, the graph is showing uh, three scenarios. Uh, bow, so with the reduction uh, around 60% in 2050, uh, reference scenario in the 80%, and the neutrality scenario is almost like a net zero, so 90% uh, reduction. Um, you can see different types of uh, uh, fuel sources. Uh, starting from uh, the up, you can see there wind and gas and biomass. Gas is the dark blue and the wind is the light blue. And there is a uh, coal and lignite. So this uh, black and brown uh, places there, there are coal. So you can see that in 2030, in our predictions, we still see, see coal in the energy mix, but afterwards it's changing. And there is a new source that we put into our energy mix, a nuclear. This is this purple one. But something that is also quite important, uh, we see the new technologies like uh, BEX, CCS, uh, or CCS on gases. This is also quite important in our energy mix. Um, the district heating, I will just leave this table because uh, maybe not, for you it's not so important, but for us, district heating and because of our uh, sometimes hard winters uh, is very important. And you can see that the, the mix is also uh, going to change from black, so from coal to a lot of gas, a lot of gas with CCS, also some nuclear. And this uh, red thing is heat pumps, especially even now there are plenty more and more, and more houses that have got their own heat houses. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to uh, sum up, I already mentioned that the, this shift technology progress is really needed in case of Poland. We already done a lot. So we start with 81%. Now we've got like 70% of coal in our energy mix and we're going to change it in the next 10 years uh, or so. Uh, we will need to do it uh, in the really uh, near future. But also there are new technologies that's supposed to be implemented. You can see them below like bags. CCS, CCU technologies, uh, electrification of industry, adoption of uh, hydrogen technologies, electromobility, and we even need to go uh, with the reduction of livestock production that was done in our uh, agriculture model. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and there is also a problem of money on financial, financial resources. On the one hand, uh, the price uh, of uh, allowances are quite important because it brings revenues for the state budget, but there are also costs uh, for, our, uh, for our industry. Uh, just to show you some, some numbers, it's of course difficult to, to compare, but uh, in our analysis, we predict that we need just for new, really new investment in energy sections, uh, sector in the period 2021-2030, around 45 billion of euros. And the modernization fund that was already mentioned, so the special fund for our electricity sector is around 10 million. So we still need a lot of funds to uh, modernize our electricity sector. The next slide, please. Um, to sum up, to sum up uh, you, um, you go through the history of uh, EU ETS, but this is like still ongoing story and we are changing it. And now there are new um, issues occurred. So uh, probably you heard CBAM, so called the uh, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Uh, there is also market stability reserve that we use uh, to uh, run the number of allowances on the market. Um, the uh, forestry, so the CF sector will be quite important. The redistribution of uh, other uh, other um, sectors, so non-ETS sector, and the, the, the targets for them is also an uh, interesting issue. Uh, now European Union is going to um, share the scope for building, so uh, community, uh, for, for buildings and transport sector. There are plenty of new things going on, and in case of Poland, it would be really tough uh, thing to ensure uh, energy security, uh, to, to look for financial resources, uh, and to go through this very uh, difficult tr transformation of our system. Um, the last slide, I suppose. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I'm really happy uh, to answer all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that was very, very interesting. And I think particularly for the Indonesian audience, the current reliance on coal in Poland isn't that dissimilar from the situation in the power sector in Indonesia. And also your roadmap to 2050, I think Indonesia has already started a conversation on the net zero pathways. And I think there'll be a lot of uh, lessons exchanged between both of you, not least the costs involved in raising the finance necessary to finance the transition. So I look forward to an interesting conversation over the longer term on this. But now I'm going to hand you over to Daniel Sturge from the UK, where he's going to talk a little bit about the UK ETS. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, morning all, afternoon all. Uh, let me just share my slides. Hopefully that's gone full screen for everyone, um, shout, shout if not. So yeah, morning all, uh, as uh, Kieran kindly introduced me, I'm, I'm Daniel Sturge, I'm Carbon Policy Practice Manager Energy Systems Catapult, and I'm gonna quickly talk about uh, the recent design and Im implementation of the UK ETS here in, in the UK. Um, just a kind of quick intro to the, the Energy Systems Catapult. We're, we're an innovation center uh, based in the UK. We work, as Kieran said, closely with government advising on things like the, the UK ETS, but a whole host of other um, transition challenges um, for, for reaching net zero uh, across a, a myriad of different expertise. Um, I obviously work in the, the policy team, but we, we have a modeling team, um, consumer insights team, infrastructure engineering team, and a half a dozen other teams. But I won't uh, dwell on that too long. So I, I thought it would be useful to, to provide some context on on why the UK implements its own ETS. As um, Peter alluded to earlier, there were 28 members of the EU ETS and now there are only 27. And the, the reason for that is because in 2016, the UK uh, voted to leave the European Union, which is um, a debate for another day. But as a result of that, we part of what was agreed as, of leaving the European Union was that the UK would also no longer participate in the, the EU ETS. Um, and so once the transition period ended at the end of last year, the, 
the UK formally left the EU ETS and committed to establishing its own system. Now, in the, the period up to the, the end of the transition period, and it was right up to the, the wire, the UK government consulted on and designed two broad options. Um, and I think this is particularly relevant because I think this is the same process that the uh, Indonesian government are going through at the moment. So the first option was a UK emissions trading system. So our Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, also known as BASE, uh, consulted and on the design of a UK ETS in the mid-2019. And I'll discuss a bit more in detail in, the, in a few slides. Uh, but simultaneously, our Treasury Department also um, announced in their March budget, so uh, early last year, just before the, the pandemic really took hold here in the UK, they would legislate for a carbon emissions tax as an alternative carbon policy pricing policy. Uh, it was always government stance that the UK ETS would um, be the preferred, preferred option, but given the tight timelines on designing its own emissions trading system by a, a year, a couple of years, um, it felt it prudent to have a backup that would in essence follow the same process of the ETS, but apply a, a simpler tax. Um, ultimately, the covered sectors, which are again discussed shortly, industry power generation and, and some of aviation were not informed of the government's decision to implement the UK ETS until the publication of its energy white paper. Uh, in December of last year, so quite literally only a few weeks before its implementation. Um, this obviously left uh, much of industry quite tense in the run-up to, to Christmas here in the UK, but we we eventually um, found out what the UK uh, government had decided. So I just quickly, before delving into some of the design choices and um, things that were consulted on, which I think will be useful for Indonesian government colleagues here, is that why the UK ETS was a better choice over a carbon emissions tax. Now, this, this is um, coming from the perspective of the energy systems catapult, but many colleagues across the industry as well uh, agreed with us. Fundamentally, the outcome we're trying to achieve is emissions reduction. Um, and by setting an explicit cap on emissions instead of an explicit price, it's far easier to guarantee that outcome. Um, it also allows here in the UK at least to better align the, the carbon policy with legally binding targets. So we have carbon budgets which run every five years um, and these are legally binding, we have to meet them, um, as well as our net zero target by 2050. Um, we've also done a, a, a host of international case studies which show that setting an explicit carbon price, so particularly through a carbon tax at the level required to achieve the desired emissions reduction is potentially very challenging politically. Um, I think, again, Indonesia started to experience this with its, its recent announcement of the $2 per tonne of CO2 for coal um, being potentially lower than maybe was expected. And then through using an emissions trading system, the, the price is decided by the market with participants incentivized to overachieve the option to, to bank or sell excess allowances. So, and one final point, um, that which was consulted on by government, and I'll talk about this in a second, is, is whether to have a standalone UK ETS, so one uh, which works independently of the EU or one that was linked to the EU ETS. Now, the advantages of a standalone from the UK's perspective was to, to make design choices, such as expanding sectoral coverage, increasing cap ambition, um, and better interactions with wider UK carbon policy framework, but also still leaving the, the possibility for future linkages with other emissions trading systems, including the EU, but potentially anywhere else in the world. Um, so I'm just going to quickly have a very high level run through the, the types of things that the UK government consulted on. So as I mentioned, uh, they consulted in July of 2019 um, and it was implemented on the 1st of, of January 2021. So we're, we're coming up to the first anniversary of the UK ETS uh, here shortly. Um, scope, the proposed was is fairly straightforward. It was to match that of the EU ETS, both in respect of sectors and greenhouse gas covered. Um, so Peter highlighted those sectors and the greenhouse gas is covered. But in essence, the, the idea here was that we have these operators already um, operating in the EU ETS and now transitioning to UK ETS. So they're set up from a MRV perspective, from a trading perspective, um, and we're, we're ready to, to turn around quickly um, at short notice. Cap and trajectory. Um, again, it was it was a similar process to the EU ETS, and I'll, I'll come on the next slide to what the, the decision was on this, but we have increased ambition slightly here in the UK with um, further plans to do so in the future. Free allocation, which has been um, a hotly discussed topic this morning. Uh, we use this approach. Uh, there's there's quite a lot of text on the, the, 
the, the reasoning behind this and the, the calculations and what data is used, um, there's a link in the slides and I'm sure we can we can share these after the fact. Um, this document contains all those that information. Uh, but predominantly it was it was following a fairly similar approach again, in, at least in the in the near term as the EU ETS. We also uh, proposed to introduce something called the supply adjustment mechanism, which would provide a price stability on an annual basis. So it would adjust supply within the cap. Uh, this is very similar to the EU's market stability reserve, which um, has been fairly successful in recent years in, in helping uh, maintain the, the price, but obviously uh, we've seen quite a spike of, of recent. And on a similar vein, uh, the cost containment mechanism, which is um, provided to, proposed to provide a safeguard against significant uh, in-year price spikes. And I believe the, the regulators here in the UK are debating whether to um, employ that now because we're already seeing quite an increase in price in, in the few months that we have been trading. So, as I said, we've uh, had the UK ETS nearly now for a year. Um, we implemented a standalone UK ETS, so not linked to the EU. Um, I think linkage was always going to be incredibly difficult, the timelines to do. And um, as those who follow news here in the European Union um, and, and, and in the UK will be well aware that the Brexit talks were not necessarily the, the most cordial of times. And so um, I think the, the linkages between the two and it, emissions training systems were low on a priority list, unfortunately. Um, the cap and tra trajectory were equal to the UK's notional share of the, the EU ETS should it stayed in phase four, so between now and 2030, minus 5%. So we've increased our ambition by 5% um, straight off the bat. Free allocation as proposed, but there's now a targeted review going on um, by government. Uh, and this is in light as well of recent uh, announcements by the European Union for carbon border adjustment mechanisms. So it'll be interesting to see how, how free allocations uh, evolve over time. And we're, we're speaking with government on that point. Uh, the supply adjustment mechanism was introduced as proposed, but um, is not operational until mid of next year due to the requirement of at least one year of verified UK emission data. And finally, the cost containment mechanism um, was introduced as proposed as well. But then there are various caveats to, to how that's applied, um, but I won't go into the details of those here. So just a, a, some quick numbers. We had our first UK ETS auction uh, take place in May 2021. So it did take five months to get the auctions up and running. Um, still a, a Herculean effort by uh, civil servants here in the UK. Um, and auctions run every two weeks. And just as an example of the kind of the, the progress we're, we're seeing, uh, the most recent um, auction took place on the 1st of December, so earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, the clearing price was £65 per tonne of CO2. The, the first one in May, I believe, was £45 per tonne of CO2, so we've already seen a, about a £20 increase. Um, and from this one auction alone, so bearing in mind these run every two weeks, we raised a third of a billion pounds in revenue, so substantial money from, from the sectors covered here in the UK. And there's just finally, um, what does the government intend to change in the future? So I, I alluded to this, to, uh, to this earlier, but the government's fundamentally going to, has promised to, to consult on two things. The one being uh, the cap and trajectory, what that's going to look like uh, before, before too long. So how do we align up with our net zero targets in particular with the target to, to implement that by January 2023? So fairly soon in, in ETS terms, um, but that's going to be really key for for the emissions trading system here in the UK to remain our cornerstone of our, our policy framework. And the other one, and potentially more interesting one, is expanding sectoral coverage of the UK ETS. So we're starting to see this in the EU, uh, Germany in particular, but the UK is also um, looking to consult on this. Now, recent gas price spikes here in the UK have, have potentially uh, postponed this from happening, um, but it, so it's unclear which of the sectors will remain a priority, but it's likely to be heating for buildings. Uh, which is a huge um, contribution to our emissions here in the UK because we rely heavily on natural gas. Surface transport, equally a, a huge sector for emissions, despite um, high uptake of EVs here in the UK. And then the other two sectors, maritime and waste, are, are likely to be covered at the, in the near future. Um, this will end up covering quite a lot of emissions here in the UK if we if we do go down this route, um, with agriculture being really the, the one that's left, but agriculture is a, a difficult topic for another day, um, and likely the, the ETS may not be the best mechanism for, for that process. So that was a very quick presentation overview of the, the ETS, but I, I hope that's um, proved useful. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Daniel. That was very, very interesting. And I think, if anything, the UK has to be congratulated for getting the ETS up and running independently in such a short time period. Now, I'm sure there are many, many questions from the audience for both of our participants from Poland and the United Kingdom. But given the time and the, the, the minor delays we had at the start of the session, I'm going to pass you back to Bathy, who will uh, take the session on from here before we start the third session, where we'll be happy to take any questions any of you have to both the participants in this session or in the previous session. So thank you very, very much for joining this session. Over to you, Bati. Thank you, Kiran. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And thank you, uh, Marta. Bapak-Ibu sekalian, uh, terima kasih. Uh, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for staying with us. And this is now the third session. In this third session, we sincerely expect that you will have an active participation, specifically from Indonesia, where we have international experts today. We may raise questions, we may make consultation, and therefore, I would like to give... So first, I would like to apologize. We should have concluded the webinar until 4.30 Indonesia time. But because we were delayed, so we apologize. Perhaps there will be a slight delay. And maximum, we will conclude this by 5 p.m. Jakarta time. And we will give the first opportunity for Director General of Electricity because they are mandated to maintain and take care the ETS. And perhaps anyone from DG of Electricity, please uh, ask some questions or you can also comment. The time is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Bati. In the DG of Electricity, we are preparing carbon trade and some of the resource speaker already elaborated many aspects. So I have a question. There will be no comments from me because all of your presentation will be our input in determining the trade carbon. My first question. From the first session, presentation from Kieran, So the cap is for maximum total emission covered by sectors or certain sectors, whereas at the moment, we only have one sector under the ETS. So how can you determine the cap if you only have a sector, namely the power generator? Perhaps the previous presentation, you mentioned that there is absolute width intensity, but perhaps you can further elaborate what should we do? What will be the most suitable? Because in the future, we will execute ETS, whether we apply cap and tax or carbon tax. Should we select absolute or intensity? And what will be the consideration? You mentioned about cap ambition. How good would that be if we determine the roadmap for the cap? establishment. And second, regarding carbon pricing, if you have intervention for lower price or higher price, what kind of intervention that can be applied by the government or by the authority? And I don't know whether you mentioned about this or not. Perhaps I did not listen it quite clearly. What happened about carbon pricing overseas? Would that impact the power generation costs. So will there be special action? So we're not going to use the BPP. I forgot in which presentation. For trial in the ETS 2005 until 2007. So you have three years trial. So I think it was presentation for Peter Fish. And what will be the consideration for trial period? Why you determine three years and how do we do the evaluation? 
that we can determine that we can continue to the mandatory phase. That's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So there were many questions and hopefully the speakers or the panelists can grasp the question. So I'd like to invite Kieran to answer the question. Well, I think the first part of the question was for us and it referred to what we had in the presentation. In terms of which scheme or which choice is appropriate for Indonesia, I don't think it's for us to give an answer on that other than to say that you have a number of choices. And in terms of the intensity-based cap, our view is that's more suitable for emerging market and developing economies where there's less predictability in the medium to long term. So what it does, it, it allows um, utilities to reduce their emissions um, without restricting the overall growth of the economy. In terms of the overall emissions cap for the power sector, we see that tends to be adopted in a lot of the more developed economies in the world. The thing is, in the power sector, it's a lot easier to implement an ETS from the outset, and I presume that's the reason Indonesia chose that first, because the level of accurate data that's already available compared to the industry sectors. And we heard in the earlier presentations from Peter and Stefano and the questions we had, the challenges in obtaining the data necessary for the ETS. On the second part of your question, I think just to finish on that point, it, we're, we're not going to be prescriptive in telling Indonesia what it should and shouldn't do, but rather that we will present examples from global experience and allow you to choose then which mechanisms are most appropriate to your own local circumstances, which you will do in consultation with industry and stakeholders. It's a long process, and you saw from Stefano's and Peter's presentations how long it took the European Union to get its ETS right. It was hit and miss. Learn, uh, learn long learning process. On the other hand, you saw from the UK how they were able to get their system up and running quickly based on their experience of previously operating in the EU ETS. The final part of your question, I'm not sure which of the presentations it referred to, but I think it was Peter's. Mm, no, Mr. Bati, uh, Bati, can I make some interruption to? Yeah, yeah, Silaban. Uh, so, uh, no, Mr. Kellan, I'm asking about your still in your presentation regarding the interface, what kind of interface uh, we are uh, that can we can do to oh. setting the carbon oh, price. And your presentation, you say that you, you, whether it's low price or the high price, that we can make some intervention. So, maybe you could please share to us what kind of interface that we can uh, we do to uh, the market so that make us maybe not so a higher price or to a lower price be that thank you okay well the eu ets of it has had substantial experience of low prices which acted as an impediment at times to fuel switching um, and they've introduced a number of changes to the eu ets such as the market reserve mechanism in the uk for example they felt that the prices in the eu ets were too low to facilitate the low carbon transition as they envisaged. And around 2013, they introduced a carbon price floor, which was, I think, about 20 pounds or euros per um, uh, unit. And that had the effect of incentivizing switching from coal to natural gas over a period. So there are mechanisms that you can use in terms of low price. There are also intervention mechanisms in place in the RGGI and in California as well. In terms of the higher prices, we've seen less so. But what we could have is the injection of extra permits into the market at a very high time price, high price to dampen demand. But at the moment, we're not seeing any measures or explicit measures from the EU to address the very, very high prices that you've seen in a number of the presentations. And I'm not fully aware of discussions that are ongoing at the EU to manage these high prices um, because they're relatively new to us. Um, as you saw from the trend lines that featured in a number of the presentations, we started from a very, very low place and nobody anticipated this huge spike that we're going through at the moment. And I think it's, it's frontier territory for us. So perhaps Peter may be familiar with any discussions that are ongoing within the European Union, but I know a number of member countries are intervening directly in terms of taking measures to reduce energy costs to consumers. But at EU level, I think uh, maybe I defer to Peter for his knowledge or experience of the discussions that are going on at the moment. Shall I continue then? Yeah, please. 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 Uh, well, thank you for the question. 
I would only say that I share or I have shared in the past the concern you have, the uncertainties you have as to how best to do things. You know, the truth is you will find out as you move forward, but I would encourage that a start is made. Um, and that's a little bit how we approached it in the European Union. We started with a pilot phase for three years, just in order to give ourselves time to learn how the mechanism worked. As policymakers, as companies who were covered by this system, including the power generators, and as markets, we didn't really know how the market would be set up because it wasn't foreseen in the legislation. So it was really a question of us trying something and we decided on three years to give ourselves time to familiarize ourselves with the compliance cycle. Um, that is to say the allocation process um, and then the monitoring and reporting that companies had to do at the end of every calendar year, the verifiers who had to validate those reports, and as I said, the trading itself. Um, so we thought three years was long enough to learn sufficiently before the Kyoto Protocol's commitment period started in 2008, 2012, where the European Union had a legal obligation. We wanted to meet our target. So we considered three years of experimentation before the real thing started in 2008. That was just a prudent way to begin. And then equally in China, they've started with pilot phases um, and, and they're going in a progressive way, which you know is, I think, uh, to be recommended. Um, the power sector in every country, in the EU, in, in the Indonesia and in China, for example, is probably the biggest single source of emissions. Um, in all ex experiences I know of, of emissions trading systems, the prices tend to start low because actually the allocations tend to start more generously. We started in the power sector for the first three years all the allocations were on the basis of historic emissions, so grandfathering. We didn't use benchmarks in those days. And so we tried to determine what the emissions were for each individual power station. And we said, okay, you must reduce them by X percent. And it's a way of starting. Once you start, you get data, and you can always adjust the percentage reductions in the next phase. So we did allocations um, annually. Uh, no, we did it for three years at a time, the first phase, and then we did it again for the commitment period phase of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and the second time we did it better than the first. Um, even though the methodologies of, of allocation had not changed. So uh, that's how we did it. Historical emissions was our starting point. And um, it meant that a coal fired power station was allocated more than a gas fired power station, but they both had an incentive to reduce their emissions. And that's the beginning of a system that if you like delivers emissions reductions. And then how quickly you progress, how ambitious you are, those all depend on the specifics of your nationally determined contribution. Well, Daniel, uh, yeah. or uh, Marta, Stefano, do you want to add? If I may add two things. Uh, yes, about, please, the, about the intervention, it was already mentioned that there are several uh, possible ways to intervene and uh, in case of those high price uh, it was already mentioned by Kieran that we are waiting 
what what would be the situation uh, there is uh, article 29a some kind of intervention that could be possible in case the the the, the high price will be uh, with us for a longer time and we are waiting for the uh, situation to, to to develop but we are currently discussing the issue on several uh, places in the European Council because the, the price not only of, e, uh, of EU ETS allowances but also of other fuel sources are like, uh, quite huge and could be problematic. Mm, and another thing that uh, for us could be uh, quite interesting and I think that no one mentioned that uh, this is kind of some kind of uh, dynamic allocation. So um, we are now uh, even in European Union we've got this allocation based on the uh, recent year uh, activities. So in case of, for instance, heat, it could be like that, that one year the heat production could be 30% uh, higher or lower. So we are um, adjusting the allocation to the, uh, the, the situation the previous year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Daniel, you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to come in and actually uh, mention on just uh, the I think, like I said in the presentation, and it price is a is a fairly hot topic at the moment. When it comes to energy, just because um, we have we have increasingly high gas prices as a result of uh, gas price spikes here in in Europe, um, and and with the the power sector already being covered by the ETS uh, here in the UK as well as the EU, uh, this is obviously um, increasing the price even further for electricity in particular, where where the current price exists. In addition to that, in the UK, we have a, an additional carbon tax of sorts called the carbon price support, which was originally introduced to, to bolster the EU, ET, EU ETFs price on power generators alone uh, when it was very low. Uh, in, but this remains today. So despite clearing at £65 per tonne of CO2 within the UK ETS, we have an additional £18 per tonne of CO2 on top of that for power generators. Um, so we're getting quite close to, to, to very high prices for, for power generators, plus we have a lot of other policy costs here in the UK through uh, com, uh, com, contracts for difference for renewable energy, feed-in tariffs, etc. And all of this is compounding on top of um, the, the wholesale price, which is increasing as a result of the gas spikes. So I guess the point I wanted to get across is that when designing things like an ETS or carbon tax is, is to be very cognizant of the, the wider policy framework in which they sit. Um, it's, it's all very well and good to be quite focused on the achievements of, of the ETS and, and the cap and how that's applied. But if it's not taken as, a, as within the wider policy framework, then there's, there's real risk that, that costs start just building up on, on specific vectors, and particularly here in the UK on electricity, which runs counter to what we're trying to achieve with emissions reduction where natural gas is, is virtually unpriced. Um, and so I just wanted to make the kind of the colleagues here aware that, that the wider policy framework is really key here. And I think the Indonesian government have a, an opportunity to start from scratch where maybe the UK wish we could do that in some places because we're in a, a bit of a messy situation, for some things, particularly electricity policy. Um, and so, yeah, really seize the opportunity and, and think about that wider landscape as, as, a, as a whole system and not as silos. Bapak Ibu, uh, saya mendapatkan informasi bahwa teman-teman PLN uh, akan ada kegiatan lain. Jadi uh, mohon izin. Uh, I received uh, information that um, our colleagues from PLN will need to leave early because they have other agenda. So I will give um, the opportunity to PLN first. So um, do you have any questions or comments? Okay, um, just a few uh, items. Yes, Pak Ilham. PLN. Uh, just, just to follow up on the question of Ibu Mayang. Because she said she hasn't got a satisfying um, response. And U UK or UTS, um, it is mentioned that the government do not trade, only the allocation payment, is that correct? And this is for the primary market. But for secondary market, uh, businesses trade, right? It's about the, how, how the interpretation, I think is the, this is in uh, the secondary market because in your business market and your business uh, do, Trade, 
So uh, we cannot control the uh, carbon price. So uh, as we know that uh, the UETS, there is a committee, committee for the stabilization for the carbon price. I think itu uh, Pak pa, pa Batih untuk uh, meluruskan aja bahwasanya ada uh, komite stabilisasi harga karbon di UITS Pak Batih. Terima kasih Pak Batih. Okay. Terima kasih Pak uh, Ilham. Peter, do you want to respond? I will try, but I'm not sure I properly grasped the question. But it is a fact that businesses can't control the price. It's the uncertainty of the mechanism. Whereas if governments are to apply taxes, you can at least know the level of the taxes and, and plan accordingly. That is, if you like, the, the uncertainty of emissions trading. But as a, uh, that's the disadvantage, if you like, from a business perspective. The advantage is that you governments can achieve emission reductions more cost effectively. And, and that's because those installations who can reduce their emissions more cheaply will be the ones who make investments and they will there, therefore have allowances to sell. They get money. The allowances that make the investments, they receive the money. So they're happy, if you like. Um, and the installations where it's more expensive to reduce your emissions, they don't have to make investments. They can just buy allowances as a cheaper alternative. So from an economy-wide perspective, it's more cost-effective, less costly overall for this, for this mechanism to work that gives you the flexibility as compared to a tax where everybody has to pay regardless of you know what their own performance is um so we 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 have argued that it is overall worth doing and businesses like it in europe businesses wanted the emissions trading system they did not want energy taxes because they liked this flexibility they had to decide whether to invest or whether to pay for more allowances. Even if they were paying competitors, it was their choice. And they could do neither. They could, if you like, neither invest nor reduce allowances or, or buy more allowances. If they wanted not to do any trading, they just had to make sure that their emissions matched the cap or the allocation that they were given. So they had three choices. They could invest and reduce their emissions. They could buy allowances, or they could just make sure that they complied with the cap that was being imposed. And businesses always prefer those options to having a tax just imposed upon them. So in Europe, business was advocating for emissions trading as a way of meeting our climate commitments. Pak Ilham, apakah uh, masih perlu ada tambahan? Pak Ilham, would you like to have more responses? Yeah, I think we need to share with the panelists there is the uh, stabilization, so market stabilization committee. Let's move on to Mr. Komang. Mr. Komang is from the PLN or the SOE utility companies. And the time is yours, sir. I would like to share some uh, ideas. I've listened to the sharing session presented by speakers. There are several points that I'd like to clarify. So the first, if I were not mistaken from Mr. Peter, the carbon trading or the ETS will be effective for large sources, right? 
So industry that generate large emissions and whether in other countries for power sector, they will limit the power generator, say only for large scale power generator. It doesn't apply for small scale. So we have an expectation that Indonesian implementation will only apply to large scale because small scale have challenges in their finance. And that was the first. My second point, we hope that the carbon trading program will run well. Certainly we need the market and there should be the participation of the industry. Therefore, what is the central role of the industry? In this case, the PLN or the SOE utility companies, the trial that we've done was very simple. As we mentioned, we found out that ETS is very complicated. That's our perception. So, What's the important role conducted by the industry or the operator? And when it was implemented, what will be the necessary preparation that needs to be done by the industry? And then my next point, I hope you can inform us There will be emission auction, and in the auction, there will be revenue, and the revenue comes from the auction, and that could be utilized for other activities. And whether from the auction revenue, can that be return to the industry. Can that be done uh, for mitigation conducted by the industry, say for efficiency or investment for new technology? Of course, to ensure efficiency. So what will be the procedure? And if it is permitted, would that be in the form of grant or should there be interest applied? Thank you. Please, Peter. Thank you. They were great questions. And it, it reminds me of all the discussions we had in Europe 20 odd years ago. And we still have today, as, as Marta has made clear, the emissions trading system in Europe continues to be controversial. Um, not everybody likes it. But I think climate policies are not always very popular because they have costs. And what emissions trading does above all is try to minimize those costs, which is of course important to all the businesses that operate in Europe. We could do it in other ways using other instruments like purely regulatory instruments, emission limit values for a coal-fired power station. And those sorts of regulatory measures are likely to be more costly. So, you know, it's, it's a choice that a country has to make, uh, what measures it uses and what costs it can afford. Um, we started with the large sources in Europe because we considered that they were able to manage the complexities of monitoring their emissions and of uh, trading if they wanted to buy or sell allowances. We were of the view that small sources would find that too complex. And so small entities like small businesses and households are governed by national regulations and efficiency standards at the European level, but they're things which are much more traditional environmental instruments. Um, 
So I think it is true that most emissions trading start with large sources of emissions. I would say perhaps to expect, I would expect Indonesia to start that way, but that's Indonesia's decision, of course. You have an impression that ETS is very complicated. A lot of people share your impression. But running a business is very complicated. I couldn't do that. There are so many things to think of. And this is just one more aspect of running a business. The cost of polluting becomes a cost factor in your business, just like the raw materials and the labor. And you have to decide whether to make investments just like businesses do all the time. So I think it is a mechanism that businesses can manage, they can cope with. It sounds complicated when you hear about it, but through familiarity, it can be less intimidating. Um, what the best thing industry can do already now is measure its emissions, is, is know from which chimney stacks CO2 emissions are coming from. And if there's a good, if the company knows its emissions profile, it's in a much better place to negotiate also with government, but also to know itself how it could reduce those emissions. Because in the early years of emissions trading, we found that companies could reduce their emissions by just being more efficient without necessarily making big investments. Um, and, and those were almost win-win solutions. They saved energy, they reduced their costs, um, and they reduced their emissions at the same time, which was all beneficial. And the big oil company, BP, uh, tried an emissions trading system internally, and they found exactly the same thing. Their business units saved money when they monitored their emissions and they could reduce uh, them because they also saved energy. Finally, I don't want to talk too long. Auctioning revenues accrue to governments and governments can do what they want with them. <laughs> and in Europe, they do use some, we do use some funds for helping industry innovate, for investing in energy efficiency improvements. Some governments use the revenues from emissions trading to subsidize renewable energy deployment, like, you know, solar panels, wind, wind turbines, and other governments use the revenues to improve the energy efficiency of social housing, public housing. And so, and now due to the high energy prices that I forgot to address, uh, we are indeed faced in Europe with high energy prices and high carbon prices as it happens. Some governments are taking measures to try to address fuel poverty, families who don't have enough money and who need help. And the revenues from emissions trading is a very rich source of finance to help those families. And to families who don't need the help, they can, they can make investments. They can insulate their houses, they can afford that. So the incentive to do it is increased by these high energy prices. So overall, the governments decide, your government decides what it does with the revenues. And uh, it can do a lot, I'm sure. And I'm sure there's need for good revenues because in the end, the climate transition requires lots of new investment. So there's no shortage of potential uses of the revenues that can also be recycled back to industry if they so decide. So, that's what I say for now. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Marta, you, you raise your hand. Thank Could you make much. it uh, just one or two minutes? Because uh, I think we'll run out of time. Half a minute. Half a minute. So, uh, to answer your question, uh, in our case, the middle scale is quite important. So, we've got around 400 
installation like a small municipal CHPs that product electricity and heat for uh, small uh, cities or uh, towns. And for them, UETS system is quite difficult because there is like 20 megawatts thermal input that uh, all the, um, the, the, the installation need to have or more to be in the system. So it's like a middle scale and it's quite important. And in case of revenues, we have um, special funds, so national fund for environmental and water protection, and they bring grants, uh, dotations, loans for a thermal, a thermal investment, electricity, solar or uh, energy modernization. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marta. Bapak Ibu sekalian, terima kasih banyak uh, atas uh, kehadirannya. Distinguished dan... ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attendance in this discussion from the beginning until the end. We once again apologize due to our technical difficulties. That's why there was a delay. In the chat box, we have attached an information that there's a necessary link that can be downloaded. You can see the FGD materials in that link and we'd like to inform you that there will be a recording and there will be ppt materials from the resource speakers we will post it in our website and before we conclude this webinar we would like to invite miss cecilia to close the event thank you Thank you very much, Bhatti. Um, uh, we've had a very fruitful discussion today, and I'd like to thank all of our international experts, Marta, Peter, Daniel, Stefano, and Kieran, for sharing your experience in designing and implementing ETS in your, your countries and region. Uh, there's been a lot of, of information shared today, and the OECD is pleased to support our colleagues in Indonesia to benefit from the lessons in, in other countries to consider how to design their, their country's ETS. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our Indonesian participants for their questions and participating uh, during our, our discussion today. Uh, building on our fruitful collaboration between the OECD and the government of Indonesia, the OECD CEFM program is supporting Indonesia's efforts to mobilize domestic and foreign sources of finance to accelerate investments um, into the, the clean energy sector. And the implementation of an ETS in, in the power sector will be an important in supporting this transition. Um, I'd like to commend uh, DG Electricity for the development of its uh, scheme so far and to thank Pak uh, Bayou from DG Electricity for this collaboration and to thank also your team for supporting in organizing today's event. Um, a, a big thank you to, to my colleagues at the IEA, Sarah and Kieran for collaborating with us uh, um, to organize this series of focus group discussions. Uh, today's FGG is, is the second in a series of four uh, that the IEA and OECD is co-organizing together with uh, DG Electricity. Um, our uh, next session or third FGG will be held in February uh, next year. And we'll be really looking at the financial market aspects of trading this was touched on briefly by Peter in his presentation. Um, and finally, a fourth uh, uh, FGD will explore the links with international carbon markets. Um, and we plan to organize this final session in, in March. Uh, more details will be shared with everyone next month. Um, and we will prepare a summary paper from all of our discussions, uh, uh, presenting some of the conclusions and key messages emerging from each of our four discussions that can help Indonesia design its, its ETS. Uh, finally, a, a big thank you to uh, Pak Bati for being our MC today and to our interpreters for their support uh, throughout today's discussion. I wish you all an excellent day and look forward to welcoming all of you back um, uh, next year in our uh, next FGD. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Terima kasih. Bye-bye, Ibu sekalian. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.